Hello, everyone. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic.online, the humanity social media app. And we are back with another episode with Dr. Jonathan Cook. I am very excited to be having this conversation today because we're going to be talking about a favorite subject of mine. We're going to be talking about H.G. Wells's The Time Machine. And philosophically, uh, and, and from a literature perspective, I have to say that the entire work of H.G. Well, Wells and this book in particular rings a lot of bells for me, Dr. Cook. So I'm very. I, let's just jump right into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, uh, a, I'm a great Wellsian too. Certainly, a, he's a relatively neglected figure in academia today. But of course, that means he's just overdue for a revival. I and I think that revival is coming. I. I really do. I really do for a lot of different reasons. Um, but he does have a very popular following outside of academia. Yeah. There's there are many, many um, talks and courses online on yeah. YouTube that you can go. I, I consumed a number of them uh, that that I think a lot of people are, are finding new interest in him. So maybe we should talk first about the circumstances that led to the composition of the time machine. Yeah, so this was Wells' uh, big breakthrough book. You know, he'd been doing a lot of journalism in the early 1890s, and uh, he was really struggling to survive as a writer because, you know, he got his degree in zoology from uh, a sort of a London extension school, uh, really learned a lot from his mentor, Thomas Henry Huxley. And then... Um, he had to figure out what to do for a living. So he did a bunch of uh, sort of highbrow journalism, um, but he, he really couldn't support himself and his wife because he had married his cousin That's right. uh, a, a few years earlier, but he had uh, actually, he just recently left his wife to pick up with a student of his uh, whom he called Jane, you know, and they were living together in... Um, in Kent, and he had to, he, it was really a, uh, you know, necessity as the mother of invention, because he, he said, I got to write something that is going to sell, and he thought back to a book, actually a series of short stories he'd written uh, for a student publication when he was actually, a, in, you know, in the university system. Um, it was a, you know, college science journal that he actually founded. And he wrote a three-part story in that publication called the Chronic Organ uh, Chronic Argonauts, and That's amazing. It, was, I love it, was it. A, it was a very bizarre story about a time traveler with a very peculiar name, and um, you know, really had very little uh, uh, to uh, uh, content to compare with the the time travel the uh, time machine which he wrote. You know, 1894, but he he took some of the ideas of, of time travel and a guy you know guy disappearing into the future forever, and um, so you know he he produced this work in 1894, uh, in I think only a, you know a few months really, um, and it became a uh, a very popular book with his you know his publisher was Macmillan. And uh, so it kind of catapulted him into the situation where he felt confident that he could write his other science fiction work. So he, he was in, you know, very quickly writing uh, The War of the Worlds and The Island of Dr. Moreau and The Invisible Man. You know, all those, those well-known books from the mid-1890s came out pretty quickly, one after the other. And uh, he you know, realized he can make a living as a writer at that point. So, so let me ask you this. Are, are you as excited about time travel as I am? Is that why you chose this book? What, Cause you were the one who selected it. What made you choose this text to discuss? Well, I've taught it on and off for a while. And, uh, um, uh, I mean, currently I'm teaching it in a course of mine that I call monsters and nightmares. So, this is the first book we read, and it uh, it's it's a good introduction to. Uh, it's not necessarily that I'm I'm crazy about science fiction, but because I, I don't really read much of it, but um, you know I just want to 
I want to read a, a major author, H.G. Wells, um, and um, uh, read a book that was, well, emerged from the um, debates over evolution in the later 19th century and uh, just investigate how these new ideas about species evolving and the, and the enhanced understanding of the age of the earth, how, how all of this led to H.G. Wells' act of, you know, imagination in, in creating this this idea of time travel into the future because it, yeah, I'm interested in the, the history of science and the Victorian science as well. I'm, I'm a great admirer of, of Huxley and, uh, um, and you know, Darwin as well, the whole Darwinian revolution. I'm, I'm fascinated by its impact on, on America and, and England at the same time in the later 19th century. Um, so, I don't know, just a, just a good book to uh, study evolution from a, from a literary point of view and to um, read one of these iconic books just like Dracula, you know, yeah. books that really enhance your cultural literacy pretty much. Definitely, definitely. I mean, there's, a, there's so many, I think there've been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of references to the time machine in other media, and I think it'll help you sort of unlock a lot of those secrets. But I think you're right to focus on its its um, elaboration upon Darwinian theory, and that's probably where the real intellectual sustenance for this book comes from. Like, for me, I was seeking out like a robust conception of what is time, yeah. uh, what is the science of time travel, and we don't yeah. really get a lot from this book. I think the most interesting thing that we get is a uh, you know, when the time traveler sort of reappears, his friends at the dinner party ask him uh, where, you know, where he's been. And I think he replies to something to the effect of, I, I was right here. It's a question yeah. of when I was, right? Yeah. So, right. so I think that's interesting. To, I think that's interesting if you're trying to get your mind around what it means to traverse the space-time continuum. So I think it's interesting yeah. in that respect, but I think you're right. It's, it's really, it helps us, get our, our mind around what yeah. Darwinian theory is and what it could possibly lead to um, in certain dynamic situations, right? Yeah. 800,000 800, years into the future, 3 million years into the future and trying to understand the rivulets of species that yeah. happen if there are certain social conditions that are in place. And then there's probably a lot to be said for, you know, political stuff like what Wells is probably tapping into as far back as Plato's The Republic and yeah. the idea of the philosopher kings yeah, right. kind of managing yeah. everything. So, but I'll let you introduce a lot of those ideas. The question I had next was, you know, you, you mentioned that Wells was looking to be successful, to be a successful yeah. writer. Was time travel a gimmick to get his foot in the door and to get his next books underwritten? Uh, -huh. uh well, yeah, I mean, I, he'd already written about it. So, you know, he was, he was a pioneer in, in, in thinking up this as a, as a fictional idea. You know, I mean, Jules Verne uh, had done, you know, space travel and going to the center of the earth. And, uh, uh, you know, so there were interesting um, precursors to Wells, but he really set the agenda for a lot of modern science fiction, I think. And, you know, time travel, it's interesting that, you know, 10 years after this book was published, Einstein uh, set forth his, his general theory of relativity. And um, so, you know, the, the whole environment of the 1890s was a time of uh, excitement and uh, challenging of you know, social norms and consciousness of um, the problems of English society, you know, because there were, I mean, you know, Wells came from a lower class environment, you know, he's, he's, he basically uh, was, was living in poverty for parts of his life. I mean, his, his mother ended up as a lady's maid. His father was a, uh, uh, tried to open a store selling, uh, sporting goods and uh, and and then failed 
and Wells was forced to go out and apprentice as a dra in a draper shop and as a chemist. Um, and uh, he really had to struggle to get an education. I mean, he was lucky in that he found positions to advance himself. Um, so, uh, you know, he was someone who came to science. He didn't take it for granted because he really had worked hard to uh, and become a teacher, and then he studied with this great um, Victorian uh, Darwin, Darwinian, you know, Huxley. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it was a combination of a, a sort of a dreamy young man who became very focused on science, and he studied zoology, so he, he studied, uh, you know, the evolution of life and different species. He wrote a biology textbook, you know, when just before he wrote The Time Machine, a couple of years before. Um, so he was pumped up with scientific ideas, except he had the imagination of a, of a writer. And, uh, you know, so he liked to play around with these ideas that, that were sort of on the cutting edge of science and sort of imagine his way into, uh, uh, into the future by, you know, just thinking about how things would change, you know, evolve, doing thought experiments. Yep. Just like he, you know, he wrote a book of the war in the air. He, he he predicted aerial warfare before it took place. He he even uh, anticipated the invention of the atomic bomb right. um, by uh, his, you know, one of the, I forget which book it was that that set forth the idea of you know harnessing the power of the atom. Um, but it's, it's, it's true. It's like, you know, it's you know, like he had some inside information on the stuff. Yeah. He got, it, his, he, he got it right so often. That's his mind. I mean, you know, just like Poe and uh, Eureka, you know, po, every, yeah. people read Poe's Eureka and they and they are amazed at some of his insights. Of course, it was just his imagination. There was no scientific um, proof that he was presenting. But the yeah. thing that strikes me about the time machine is, yeah, he gets by on so little. You know, his time machine, he never describes how it works. It just has a little bit of ivory, and it's got a little lever. It's got a lever. Got a, if you, a lever, you know, put yeah. it up and down, you know? <laughs> That's how uh, it works. That's how time yeah, travel works. Yeah, because Wells was, a, was an avid bicycle rider. You know, he has it as, a, as the seat is like a saddle, like he's getting in a bicycle, and he does the lever. And there's nothing, you know, describing what it looks like. or So, of course, he's, it's, it's really just sort of like a, you know, fairy tale. Um, and uh, so, uh, but that's, that goes, how, that's that's how all science kind of starts out, right? <laughs> it seems kind of, it comes yeah. from a lot of fairy tales and mythological yeah. ideas, and then we have to substantiate it. So, you know, like you mentioned Einstein earlier, he he did the famous thought experiment of traveling on a yeah. light beam, right? Right? right. Which, yeah, exactly. To get to his conclusions, but it doesn't really matter where our imaginations <clears throat> goes, so long as the evidence supports it. Yeah, I mean. That's how science works. You know, you, you yeah. get the hypotheses and then you and then you try to ground it in testable, repeatable experiments. Yeah. So. Um, well, why don't you? I why don't you uh, help us understand or what the narrative structure of the novel is? Yeah. So you know, he's got it's basically a, what's called a frame story. So he has an outside narrator who's never named. Um, People think it might be the character at the end who, who sort of walks by um, as the time traveler is, is returning, but he has no formal name, and he's one of a group of professional men who are there on a Thursday night who meet regularly to discuss contemporary issues, and, you know, time travel, he's living in Richmond, which is a, a, an affluent, now it's an affluent suburb outside of London. It's uh, southwest of the city, up the Thames, and um, uh, so the, the the story is introduced by the frame narrator, and then of course the time traveler talks about the theory of the fourth dimension, and then he disappears, and he says he's arranged for everyone to come back the following Thursday to meet him there, and uh, the whole story is pretty much the story of his, the time traveler narrates his story. So when you're reading it, you see quotation marks every, at the beginning of every paragraph because he's narrating the story within the story, just like 
Right. Uh, just like Heart of Darkness, you know, uh, and Marlowe uh, uh, is starts out sitting in a boat on the Thames, you know, and he his his whole experience going up the river in the Congo is is told as a as a, uh, a narrative within a narrative. So, at the end of the story, of course, the time traveler ends his story, and we pick up with the frame narrator talking about, um, you know, whether it's true or not, and the people are expressing their doubts, and the time traveler's kind of being coy about whether it really happened. And then, of course, he's already shown them the flowers that he's brought back from the future, and um, one of the guys who was there with him looks at it and they says, well, it doesn't seem to resemble any plant that he knows of, right? So his little hint, like, yeah, this is a future flower, you know, this is a sign of the future. And then, of course, the time traveler uh, says, well, I'm going to make another trip. And um, uh, he, you know, goes right back to his machine because he wants to, you know, his appetite has been whetted for some other period of history to, to, to explore. And the, the, fr the outside narrator says he's been gone for three years now. So he's, he's just putting this story together. Um, you know, as a as a uh, completed narrative at this point. What it, what struck me though at this in this reading is uh, the little ending where the time traveler, um, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the the narrator says that uh, you know the flower that he's the time traveler's brought back uh, from the future is a sign that, you know, humane values still exist mm. at that time. So it's a little sentimental reminder that, you know, the, the human instinct for uh, altruism has not been totally obliterated by no matter what's happened in the, in the future world. So well, the, uh, that's, that raises a lot of interesting questions about what it means to be human. Yeah. Right. Um, Cause I'm not convinced that we are dealing with humans yeah. when he travels so far into the future. We have these two, we, if yeah. I, we have these two groups, we have the Aloy, am I saying it correctly? Eloy, like, yeah. Eloy. Eloy. I never said it aloud. And then the Morlocks. Yeah. And what, and what's interesting about this is, you know, I have um, some, I had some preperceptions about Wells based on some of his, his other work that I had consumed. And what I noticed is who you think the Morlocks and the Aloy are is kind of a, it's kind of a Warshock test. It's kind of one of those um, Wittgenstein duck rabbits where you yeah. see what you want to see. And we were having a conversation earlier about realities that we imprison ourselves in. I had mapped my own conceptual, con conceptual framework onto who the Morlocks were and who the Aloy were. And then, and then I went and I, listen to all these lectures on yeah. it. Apparently every other learned man thinks the exact opposite as I do. Huh. Uh, so every, so like I thought, you know, like I thought the, uh, I'm trying to, so I don't get this mixed up. Like I kind of had the conception that the, the Morlocks were this intellectual technocratic ruling class that had turned everybody else into chattel or to cattle. Yeah. And, I think a lot of scholars see it the exact opposite way that the intellectual ruling class was the alloy and then they became so effete and um, well, uh, complacent that, yeah. that the underlings uh, took them over in some way. Well, it's really, it's a little bit difficult. I mean, the Morlocks are definitely, uh, you know, a grotesque looking ape-like creature um, who, you know, are, who prey on the Eloy and use them for food, right? And they also seem to provide all their necessities because, I mean, they wear these kind of toga-like garments and they have these sandals and they, but, and I guess they get their fruit themselves, but, I mean, they need a minimal upkeep and it seems like the Morlocks are doing that. And there's a hint that they have some kind of factory mechanism underground. At least they have a ventilation system that brings the air down there. So Wells leaves it very um, obscure what kind of 
manufacturing ability the Morlocks have, but they're clearly the predatory class. I wouldn't say they give any sign of superior intelligence because they, you know, they have a basic fear of fire. They have this terror of fire. So they're, they're like a caveman, you know, in, in terms of their mentality. And um, I think they just have a kind of cunning in their um, leftover instincts to do work, the work that needs to be done. And then somehow they have, uh, because the earth doesn't seem to have any mammals left. I mean, there's no sign of other mammalian life except for the, for the Eloi. You know, they rely on them for food. But it's, it's clear that neither class has any kind of intellectual um, integrity or ability. Cause well, they, yeah. I would, say from, yeah. I would say from our perspective, both classes are degenerates, but they yeah. both have degenerated in different ways. Yeah. The Aloy have surrendered all, you know, have kind of embraced sort of a, uh, a childlike mindlessness yeah, and and the Morlocks have um, have embraced nefarious cannibalism. Yeah, yeah, they're know? taking advantage of the yeah. Eloy's fecklessness, right? Because mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, they don't really do anything. They haven't really been able to defend themselves. The Eloi just basically they cling together like a herd. That's the only way. So it's like a a herd of wildebeest, you know, yeah. hiding from a yeah. from a from a lion. Um, but there's nothing particularly uh, outwardly uh, or violently predatory about the Morlocks. I mean, they're when the funny thing is when the narrator describes being attacked by them, he says that they kind of touch him with these kind of wimpy uh, paws. I mean, they're not grabbing him. They're not stabbing him with weapons. They're they're sort of it's almost like they're they're sort of weak creatures who can't do anything without being in a gang, you know, and they, and they, they just, they don't seem to even have that much physical strength um, because it's more the sense of being touched by them uh, that arouses his horror than actually uh, having them, you know, snarling in his face or anything. They, and they're not very well described. They're more like, you know, they have big eyes, they have pale skin. They're kind of pale ape-like creatures who move around quickly. I guess they, they have a sort of chimp-like um, agility because they're described as moving around like spiders. So, you know, I guess maybe they do have the strength, but certainly they, when they attack him, they are not exerting, you know, their their full strength to uh, pull him into their well when he goes under underground there. Um, or when he's trying to get away from them, you know, in the final scene where he's beating him with his lever, you know, trying to get into his time machine to, to, to get out of there. So my thoughts anyway, on, yeah. yeah, my thoughts on who they symbolize could be affected, but I actually, I actually watched one of the uh, time machine movies. I watched the, yeah, 19, the 1960 version. Oh yeah. That's a wonderful one. I, yeah, I really I, like I didn't that. Know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you like, so, I mean, it's very easy to, uh, you know, the Morlocks in the 1960 version are like these like blue gor blue gorillas, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, then yeah the, the lawyer, the lawyer, right? These uh, they're like a beat, hippie. Uh, yeah, they're Phoenix. like beatnik flower children. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then there's the love interest, right? What's her? Um, Weena, yeah. Weena, yeah. She's quite lovely. Um, yeah, well, we don't get much of a description for her except she's she seems to be more like a child than a, an adult female, you know. And she well, and, she, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all childlike, but I mean, yeah. she's a she's a beautiful woman in the movie. Yeah, yeah um, of course. Yeah, yeah. But so so maybe that's coloring how I see these groups and who they who they symbolize. So, but who do you, I mean? I I've sort of laid out how traditional scholars understand who these types of people these two types of groups are, what do you think? What's your view? Well, I mean, I just rely on the time travelers um, theorizing, which is that each group evolved from a different social class in Victorian England, because Wells 
was a very astute social critic. I mean, he is, is a lot of his novels are exploring the class-ridden society of late Victorian England. I mean, he he had a very kind of ambivalent position because, you know, he was part of sort of the lower class, working class, but on the other hand, he had educated himself out of it into the middle class, and he kind of had a fear of, you know, the brutishness of, of the mob and the mass of people and the, you know, lower class unemployed people in England. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, and I think he, you know, Eloy are clearly the kind of degenerate upper class people that you could find, easily find in England in the 1890s, you know. At the time, there was so just vast inequalities of wealth. I mean, you have just an amazing concentration of wealth into the upper class, you know, the aristocracy and the and the uh, uh, the uh, industrialists um, who um, you know were represented the new money. I mean, you know, people uh, who are. Uh, you find in the world that of Oscar Wilde, you know, some of those upper class people, his boyfriend, um, uh, um, the son of the Marquis of Queensbury, and you know, these kind of effete aristocrats were very prominent in in, in uh, the fin de siècle, and I, you know, and I think Wells just felt all he had to do was sort of look at each group um, developing the way he studied, you know, zoology and got his degree in zoology as, as, a, as a separate species. You know, the privileged people uh, have all the money and the power, but on the other hand, the less involved they are with making a living, the more they uh, evolve to not have any use for you know, parts of their brain that make them more um, motivated or taking initiative or, um, you know, thinking out problems. There's no challenge to their life, whereas the under, the lower classes are forced to make a living and they are, you know, they're relegated to the underground, which is a very odd idea. Um, but on the other hand, you think of the Victorian class system where all the servants are below stairs. You know, a lot of people are working in mines and factories, so it's they're kind of working in these enclosed spaces. Uh, so the idea of being, you know, eventually migrating underground, I guess, you know, makes sense. It's hard to imagine a whole civilization <clears throat> developing like this with with all these working class people forced underground. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you, I don't know what the advantages would be um, for living underground at this point, except I guess that they're adapted to um, living in the dark, you know, they, they have the vision and uh, um, the, you know, it's just a question of habit, I guess, at this point. Uh, or being underground is a really good place to hide your cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess that's an idea. You know, there's something shameful about it, so they, so they, you know, they occupy a lower moral space, so that naturally they belong underground. The I guess there's also the idea of you know the caveman, um, because I think they, you know, there were there was a fair amount of knowledge about uh, primitive man at this point. You know, Neanderthal bones had been discovered in the 1850s. And they were, I think they were, you know, ex excavating caves um, and, and knew that primitive man lived in caves. So maybe that ties in with it as well. Um, well, what do, you, what do you think, just to, for a second longer, you know, I didn't, what about this idea that Wells was trying to make um, or was inspired by Plato's Republic? Do, do you see that here? And if he... And if he was, is this a critique of it? Yeah. Well, what Plato sees, you know, the philosopher kings. I I think there, there, yeah, there's a stratification. Yeah. I forget. I forget. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you know, you have the you have the uh, fighters, 
and, uh, and look working people. So yeah, stratify. But you, I mean, you don't have any mastermind here. There's no philosopher king. It's, 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 you know, it's a utopian society only in the beginning when it looks like everyone is having a nice time, you know, for the Eloi. So, um, uh, so I, I, I mean, I think Wells was fascinated by the idea of utopia, but he gives us all kinds of varieties of utopia and dystopia as well. Um, because, you know, dystopias are integral to social criticism. You know, it's news from nowhere of William Morris and the air one of uh, Samuel Butler. You know, these are contemporary books that use the idea of uh, utopia or dystopia to critique Victorian England. You know, it's an old tradition starting from uh, Sir Thomas More. Um, so this, <laughs> you know, this is a this is a world of that seems utopian at first, but then it's because the time traveler is ignorant about how things really work and in, in what he sees. Yeah. Um, so, and there's no plan to this society. It's an evolved society. You know, it's not not carefully thought out and um, and, and structured, uh, you know, in any kind of humane way. It's just what happens over time. I mean, what I mean, what you really could say. I mean, if it was a critique of Plato, I mean, what you could say is that you have you can have the best philosophical ideas about how a state ought to be organized, but then the biology is going to supersede your best laid plans. Yeah. Yeah, you exactly. know, yeah. You you can have this great idea to have guardians and auxiliaries and yeah, uh, and producers and all whatever, right? But but then if that leads to Darwinian reverberations that ultimately make that constitution unsustainable, I mean, what does yeah. that say about what does that say about all political philosophy to begin with? You know, I guess that it constantly has to be reevaluated. That there can never really be a guidebook for how. A republic yeah. ought to be constituted. I think that might be one of the biggest critiques that we could get from this. But what what were some of the time traveler's theories about the world that he found himself in? What eight hundred thousand years in the future? Eight hundred two thousand seven hundred and one. And and I'll tell you, there's a I, there's a reason he came up with that number, which we can talk oh, yeah? about a little bit later. But I, I love I mean, numerology these days, so I want to hear all about. Yeah. It. Well, I. I mean, I think there are basically three stages of his of his um, uh, theorizing about the world that he finds. You know, begin in the beginning, it seems like these the Eloy, and he only knows about the Eloy um, without knowing about the Morlocks. Uh, you know, it's a it's a utopian world that. Um, seems very pleasant but sort of boring and um, doesn't really fulfill the time travelers ideas about you know human improvement because you know they're they're really not that smart they're 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 very passive and they when he lands there with his time machine they ask him if he if he came in a you know a, in a hailstorm from the sun they think he's kind of a god who has appeared out of nowhere and there, uh, you know, and when his little friend Weena is drowning in the river, they're they're not doing anything about it. They're letting her cry out, so he has to go right. and rescue her. So they they've lost a lot of the most important human, you know, instincts and intellectual inquiry is 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 absent in in that world. So it's a very disappointing kind of utopian world for the time traveler. Then when he discovers the Morlocks, uh, you know, um, running around and uh, he thinks, well, these must be the servant class who have to hide themselves and uh, um, that, you know, just like in his own Victorian world, you know, you have the wealthy people and then you have the people who take care of their needs and uh, don't really live that well because they're not given as much money or, you know, privileges or whatever. So, and then, of course, the Morlocks 
turn out to be the social class that maintains the Eloi as a source of food. So we see kind of the utopian idea re reversing itself and then Wells saying, well, this is what happens when humans allow systematic oppression to go on over time too long so that the Victorian working class are, are uh, shown to be uh, seeking some kind of revenge on their masters by cannibalizing on them. You know, so it's it seems to be a just um, revenge for the indignities and oppressions that the lower class people have put up with over time. So, you know, over hundreds of thousands of years, this is the way things have evolved. I mean, I think, frankly, from what we know about evolution today, this, you know, this could happen in, in a few thousand years, not hundreds of thousands of years. Because modern humans, you know, we're only about 100 or 150,000 years old. And so it doesn't take that much time to evolve into slightly different humanoid creatures, you know. Which which would you rather be, a lawyer or Moloch? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, you know, the time travel identifies with the Eloi because they look more human. You know? Right. They, they have, you know, curly hair. Even though they don't have facial hair, they 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 dress and you know they look like ancient Romans, I guess, because they have these sort of togas and sandals. Um, so they. They relate more to his the world he knows, even though they have right. pointy chins and they're small, and um, you know don't behave the same way as, as humans. I wonder if anyone's ever taken liberties with this book and tried to write it from the perspective of the Morlocks. Of the Morlocks, yeah, yeah, yeah that would like, be interesting. That would that would be interesting. Um, I think you've talked a good bit already about the social structure and how it related. Uh, to Wells's own day. So maybe we should talk a little bit more about the far future that the time traveler yeah. went into. It's, uh, and I, yeah, I think this would be interesting to elaborate upon. Well, you know, he, people who think of the time machine, you know, they think of the Eli Morlocks, but then they forget that he makes two other visits into the future. So, you know, he barely escapes from being pursued by Morlocks. I mean, kind of an adventure movie ending as he gets back into his time travel machine. But then he he goes into a sort of indefinite future. Um, doesn't really say exactly, but at that point there there are no human creatures. And what he sees are these big crab-like creatures with right. sort of tentacles. <laughs> and one of them is reaching out to him uh, to touch him as he gets back into his time machine. So he sees um, a very... Um, um, uh, you know, a reduced uh, population of species on the earth. He sees a butterfly as this final kind of sign of of beauty, or or you know, some connection with the with aren't, his own world. Aren't the butterflies like kind of massive and have human faces? Yeah. Don't they? Yeah, the big well, butterflies. Like, yeah. yeah. So. It's clearly not a very inviting world, and I, I think what we're seeing is, is sort of the idea of the, you know, the entropy that was already theorized about what's going to happen to the Earth and the universe. Of course, the theory was that the, the, the energy of the sun would be burning out over uh, anywhere from 20 to 50 million years, so that, it's, it, you know, the Earth would... would um, become cooler because the sun was losing its heat and maybe eventually the planets would fall into the into the sun um, but uh, so the time traveler is, is is you know investigates that world then he goes into the, the future of 30 million years in the future and all he sees is this kind of black creature that the size of a football kind of in the edge of the water and he can't even identify it as resembling anything. And the, um, the uh, uh, you know, the seas are almost dead. And um, he seems to, the, the Earth seems to be on the brink of extinction at that point. Um, so 
this is interesting because it ties in, you know, 30 million years, it ties in with the, the idea of Lord Kelvin that the sun was going to burn out uh, within 20 to 50 million years. or You know, they had a vague idea because they had no idea that the sun burnt through, um, you know, using atomic energy. Uh, they thought the, 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 the heat of the sun came like from a fire, like a coal fire. So, of course, that's going to burn out, you know, eventually. Uh, you can't have millions and millions of years with, with you know, this big, great mass burning like a fire. Um, so, um, I think Wells was exploring the idea that this might be the ultimate limit of the Earth, the age of the Earth, you know, 30 million years. And, you know, the time traveler spends even less time there. He basically takes a look and then takes, you know, gets back in his machine and returns to the present. So he's, he's kind of testing the outer limits <clears throat> of time travel to sort of go to the very edge of life on Earth and, and see what it looks like and then kind of go back to the present. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, sit down and tell his story to everyone. Yeah. So, you know, there were a lot of um, a lot of the subjects that I look into. There's a lot of science fiction, science fantasy going on at this time. Um, I don't, did you ever did you ever encounter a writer named Ingersoll? Well, um, what 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 period is he writing in? About the same time, he wrote. Uh, I, I just, it's not really incredibly relevant to this conversation, but he uh, it's he wrote a book in like 1895 called The Marvelous Underground Adventures of Baron Trump. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah, yeah, I think I have. Well, I don't know. Is that is that um, Robert Ingersoll, the famous you know, atheist? Um, I don't I, I think it's a different Ingersoll. Yeah, uh, because yeah. there was, you know, Robert Ingersoll was a friend of Mark Twain. He was a uh, popularizer of Darwinian ideas and a, and a notorious agnostic in the later 19th century, um, who uh, came from the Midwest, actually. Actually, this um, was Ingersoll Lockwood. Ingersoll Lockwood, yeah. So yeah. Other, was he American or English? I believe he was an American, but he wrote a yeah. series of novels. Uh, he yeah. wrote, he, they're called... Uh, Baron Trump's marvelous underground adventures, um, something about his dog Balter, and then the last one, the last of the series was uh, the, called The Last President. Have you heard about this? No, I don't know this no. at all. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting. But he was writing about the same time. Well, is it is it science fiction or fantasy fiction or, or sort of? It's a it's it's kind of a little of both. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, in Baron Trump's uh, uh, marvelous underground adventures, he uh, he has a um, he has a mentor named the Dawn of All Dawns, and they go through the Ural Mountains of Russia, uh -huh. <laughs> an underground an underground cavern system. It's very interesting. Uh, but why did this one? You know, you know, this is something that's kind of contemporaneous. Why did the time machine? How did it get? Why did it get elevated to classic status? Classic sci-fi status, I should say. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, you know, Wells had a good publisher, Macmillan, and um, uh, I think, I mean, it was the mid-1890s, there was a sense of hunger for new ideas. I mean, the fin de siècle was a time of big, you know, intellectual turmoil in, um, in England, and particularly the mid-90s, it was kind of a turning point where people were open to new ideas because after the Oscar Wilde trial in 1895, um, that sort of shocked the public back into embracing, you know, more conventional values and ideas and becoming more defensive about English, uh, English, England's role in the world. But in the beginning of the 1890s, there was a, a time of kind of cultural experiment and, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of interesting um, new fiction and the artwork, you know, um, 
Audrey Beardsley, you know, was right. Was doing his illustrations for uh, the Yellow Book. Um, so, I just think there was an appetite for new ideas that Wells um, was able to take advantage of. Um, so, you know, then you know they had the picture of Dorian Gray from the early 1890s Oscar Wilde's book. I mean, that's kind of a science fiction story of a yeah, man sure. who's, you know, picture sure. reflects his real moral condition and he stays perpetually young. Um, you know, it's a parable about uh, moral responsibility and, and growth. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's about the best, best response I can give on that one. Well, I think... I think it's a great response. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer at, at succinctly. I, mean, I, I forget exactly how many actual books were sold over a certain amount of time. I mean, you know, he's not selling millions of copies. Uh, at the, you know, he's selling, uh, you know, enough to get attention at the time, tens of thousands. I, I, I think he was quite, I think his dance card was pretty full after, after the yeah. time machine. Yeah, yeah, I well, he know. just cranked out uh you know one work after i mean he was enormously prolific and um that you know was the beginning of a career that spanned you know 50 years basically of, of writing i'm so fascinated by this relationship that he had with with thomas huxley yeah like, and then how and, and what that meant for his career yeah. and and then how much that relationship goes on to um affect what aldous huxley and Eric yeah. Blair and all these other people yeah. who are writing is just, I mean, he's, the fact that all these people kind of knew each other, we're all kind of hanging out. Like, yeah, well, it's kind of amazing. Well, Wells, uh, yeah, in fact, the idea of the white sphinx, mm. uh, the kind of enigmatic creature that's there that, uh, um, you know, he has this machine next to. Um, I'm, I read an interesting article that said that he likely got it from an article of Huxley talking about the the condition of England and the relationship between social classes. You know, that was, you know, Huxley said that's the, you know, it takes the, it's the riddle of the Sphinx, what's going to happen to this oh, very volatile class world that they have in, in England with so many unemployed. I mean, he had hundreds of thousands of people tra tramping the streets in London in the 1890s. Um, and, you know, Jack London wrote a really great book about that um, experience uh, by disguising himself as a tramp, you know, going around with them. Um, so, yeah, Huxley, I think, helped, you know, um, gave him that idea of the Sphinx as the emblematic creature for the time traveler's first glimpse of the of the future. Um, but the other thing was that Wells, um, yes, he was connect, well connected because, you know, he lived in Kent and he became friends with, um, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Crane. He was good friends with Conrad, uh, Joseph Conrad. You know, he knew Henry James. Oh, wow. And Henry James admired his work. Eventually he wrote a, a very funny parody of James called Boone, which is about a hundred page story about um, with a very, very little, I mean, it's a parody of later James and, you know, all the um, belabored uh, prose about, you know, the most elementary things happening in, in his narrative. So Wells was really at the center of an amazing group of writers at the end of the century and uh, all of them you know, read each other's work and learn from each other. Of course, Stephen Crane died um, in the late uh, 90s. Um, but Conrad and uh, James uh, lived on. And, um, you know, they they kept reading each other's work. I think Conrad and Wells stayed friends for for a while. I think James kind of lost interest in, in uh, Wells. Um, so um, there's a good book about about that <clears throat> group of writers, um, and 
and I read it a while ago. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. And, yeah. And I, I think I think this white sphinx is, is the enigmatic white sphinx is something that really might be a good place to might be a good place to leave things off. But yeah, my my inclination is trying to answer the riddle of the sphinx when I when I recognize any sort of Egyptian symbology anywhere. I guess that's 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 what I know. It's time to make an exodus. Yeah, you know that's well, that's when I know it's time to come out of it. Well, it's yeah. interesting because the Sphinx is, you know, what's the riddle of the Sphinx? You know, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, three legs in the evening? Of course, man, you know. So the idea is that what has what has man become in the world of 800, 2000, 701? And um, the other thing is that the Sphinx, of course, is a composite creature, you know. It's a chimera. Uh, human yeah. chimera, yeah. Uh, which is kind of what the, the future creatures of the world are, you know, the Morlocks are, you know, kind of ape-like and the Eloi are, I mean, they almost look like little kittens. Uh, so it, it just sort of raises the idea of, you know, what does it mean to be human and raises the, I, the, 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 makes the point that, you know, human beings are products of evolution from other human, other, other animals. So, you know, our, our humanity is only a temporary uh, uh, stage of, of the development of nature. So, I think you were going to reveal the secret of the the year. Oh, the year, yeah. Well, eight hundred two thousand seven hundred one. It's. I think what I read is it's sort of designed to illustrate the idea of entropy. Um, you know, the the first number. And the second number, you know, each of the three numbers sort of being one above the other. So the idea of the world sort of winding down slowly but surely. Um, and um, because the, you know, Wells was, you know, he knew this theory and uh, I think he was sort of integrating that into the, 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 the number because it's, it's hard to represent anything I mean, it's not an arbitrary number because it, it seems so sort of formulaic. So I think the idea is that it, it's showing things winding down for the, the future. Yeah, I, no, I've noticed that numbers are very, very important in time travel movies, um, especially the number eight or the numbers 88, like uh, yeah. Back to the Future, they have the DeLorean has to go 88. Uh, Donnie, yeah. Donnie Darko has... Um, uh, a long number. I can't, I used to have it memorized, but he has it. Have you seen Naughty Darko? No. Is that a oh, movie? It's, oh, it's amazing. It's totally yeah. amazing. Uh, it's very amazing on a lot of levels. Um, I'm just looking at these numbers. I'm wondering what the sum of them is. It's 18. If you you can sum it up, to, you get to the number nine, which is significant in a in a lot of uh, numerological circles but yeah. th that's for another day yeah. uh well, well i i thoroughly enjoyed uh having this conversation and i love thinking about time travel I, I, I will probably write a book one day that involves something involving time so yeah i see this as great preparation and research for that uh but I, I think we should probably bring it to a close there yeah. and 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 maybe talk for a second about what we want to cover next yeah. All or should right. we Thank close you. off? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. I really yeah. appreciated it. Okay. All right. Bye bye.